If there are any <laughs> questions or comments, we can take them now. Okay, so uh, which battle took place uh, after these ayahs were revealed? And what was the outcome of that battle? So you have, for example, the battle of uh, the battle of Hunayn. The battle of Hunayn is, is an example. And uh, there were certain expeditions that took place. But generally, you know, th as I said, this surah was revealed in the ninth year after the Hijrah. Now, off the top of my head, I can't remember what year the Battle of Hunayn was. Does anyone recall off the top of their head? Nine and a half years. Hmm? Yeah, so uh, I, nine and a half. After a few months of the revelation of the surah. So, so, so the, 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 the Battle of Hunayn was uh, was the battle in which uh, that took place uh, shortly after this, and this was a battle in which, you know, it's it's a it's, it's a very lengthy discussion, but this was a battle where where Amir al-Mu'minin salam really saved the uh, the Muslims because they they were they were exposed to a number of surprise attacks. You know, the Muslims were very confident in their in their numbers. So you find that in this battle, Ali ibn Abi Talib as in every battle, he's the hero in the battle. But again, there were individuals who stayed behind. It's not that all of the companions joined. There are some that made excuses. But the point is that the battle that took place after this, after this, uh, the revelation of these verses it took a lot to motivate many of the Muslims to fight. And this goes to show you that, you know, to, you know, going back to the points that I mentioned, that, you know, the Arabs were not always thirsty for war, that, that they, they needed to be motivated because they started to get comfortable with, you know, with, with their lives. You know, they, they've become established, so it took... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go through all of these different justifications to motivate them to go to war. So the battle of Hunayn is an example of a battle that took place uh, after the revelation of, uh, of these verses and the Muslims were victorious in the battle of Hunayn due to the, due primarily to the valor and the courage of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salaamu alaykum Shaykh. Um, I think the Battle of Muta also took place, uh, uh, you know, before the Messenger of Islam passed away. The battle, uh, it the was battle, after this surah, I think. The Battle of Muta. Again, with, with, with some of the battles, I have to go back and check exactly when the dates were. But the Battle of, uh, of Muta, because the Battle of Muta, I'm not sure what year it was. Maybe it was, I, I, I want to say it was the seventh year. But I'm, I'm not sure. About it. Was it the ninth? Um, I, I, I'm not very really sure. sure. I, I know I know for sure that when the Prophet was on his deathbed, he wanted the Muslims to join the army of Usama to avenge the loss in the Battle of Mu'ta because the Muslims lost that battle. They suffered great losses. Ja'far ja ibn Abi Talib, Ja'far al-Tayyar was martyred in that battle. So... In the 10th, 11th year after the Hijrah, for sure there was, the Prophet was trying to motivate the Muslims to avenge what happened in the Battle of Mu'ta. But with these verses, I'm not sure if this was before or after the, uh, the Battle of Mu'ta. But for sure, without a doubt, the Battle of Hunayn definitely took place after the revelation of these verses. Shaykh, I have a question here. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says قَاتِلُوهُمْ يُعَذِّبْهُمُ اللَّهُ بِأَيْدِيكُمْ وَيُخْزِيهُمْ وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَيَشْفِ صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ Okay, and then you explain about the hearts. But when, uh, after every salah or sometimes when we make dua, for uh, regarding Imam Hussain alayhi salam's assassination, uh, there is a sentence which we say, Inna le katlil Hussain hararatan fi kulubil mu'mineen la tabrudu abada. So, can you throw some light on that, please? Because even that is regarding the heart and you know the rage in the heart. So, one thing that I was actually going to mention, and I'm glad that you brought it up, you know, and when you look at the you know the verses. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this idea that 
you know, seeking revenge against these mushrikeen who caused so much harm to the Prophet, who drove a lot of the Muslims out of their homes, that this battle is going to be a way for them to heal their hearts. Now, if you think about it, brothers and sisters, the mu'mineen here, what did they suffer? They lost, you know, some loved ones. They lost maybe a relative, a sibling, a father. They were driven out of their homes. They witnessed the prophet. The prophet was uh, expelled from Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a point that, that their hearts are healed. Now, when it comes to Imam al Hussein, what happened to Imam al Hussein is incomparable to what happened to these mu'mineen. If the hearts of these mu'mineen were injured because of the hardships that they faced, what, what is happening now? You know, what, what happens to the heart of Fatima al Zahra? knowing that this will happen to her grandson. How about the heart of Rasulullah himself? How about the, the heart of the 12th Imam? So this is why, you know, this ayah, where Allah says, وَيَشْفِ صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ This ayah can also be used as evidence for the 12th Imam. For the Raj'ah, we can even use it for evidence for the Raj'ah, that that one of the roles of the 12th Imam is that he will heal the heart of the Ahlul Bayt because of what happened to Imam al Hussein. Now, of course, there will always be that, that burning because of what happened to Imam al Hussein. There is no one that can compensate for that, that type of that pain except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to a certain degree, the 12th Imam will avenge the enemies and those who had the same ideology of Imam al Hussein, uh, of the enemies of Imam al Hussein. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so adamant about healing the hearts of the believers who are distressed because of their calamities, then definitely. The heart of Sahib al Zaman is much more dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah will afford him the opportunity to defeat the enemies of his, his forefathers. So, this ayah, we can definitely read it in the context of the dhuhur of the 12th Imam. And that even our hearts, to a certain extent, will be healed, not fully, because. What happened to Imam Hussein you can never remove that grief from the hearts. But to a certain extent, avenging what happened to Imam Hussein, establishing the hukuma of the 12th Imam, defeating the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, that will bring a certain degree of healing to the hearts of the Mu'mini. Well, uh, question regarding this. Don't beat ayats apply to us uh, us now this time to wake up and stand and uh, defend for the cause of imam hussein and imam sahib zaman and you know uh, make an army motivate people work uh, you know towards uh, being the uh, nasirs of uh, uh, imam sahib zaman as you said that when you wake up when you come forward, then only Allah's Nusra will come and help, uh, Allah's uh, help will come to you. And do these ayats apply to us now? So, what we know for sure is that the ultimate victory, the victory of haq over batil, of truth over falsehood, will materialize at the hands of the 12th Imam. But at the same time, the Imam السلام, needs us to lay the groundwork. The Imam السلام, when he when he reappears, he needs to have the groundwork in place that we have to pave the way for him. Now, what we have to bear in mind is that Ahlul Bayt السلام, what do they say? 
أفضل أعمال أمتي انتظار الفرج that the best action is to await the reappearance now it's interesting if you look at the wording of the hadith now when you think of waiting waiting we usually equate it with inaction when you're waiting you're not doing anything but Ahlul Bayt they're speaking about a very specific type of intivar if intivar was just being lazy and not doing anything they wouldn't say that it is the best amal which means intivar is an action it's not being passive when Ahlul Bayt say afdalul a'mal so it's not only an action it is the best action and that is awaiting the reappearance meaning laying the groundwork for the imam support you know listening to our maraja being you know having the socio-political awareness listening to the islamic leadership understanding what our responsibility is in this time being united against the enemies of islam and the enemies of humanity not just the enemies of islam this is when we, this this is exactly what we have to do to begin the process of you know shifa al-sudur you know to to heal the heart of the 12th imam but unfortunately we are increasing the pain in the heart of the 12th imam by being by being uh, by being lazy by not doing anything by being inactive but i think the most important thing for us in this time and this is what the Ahlul Bayt have taught us, is that during the Ghaiba, we have to listen to the ulama, we have to listen to the marja'iyya, the maraja, that we should not act independently of them. Ahlul Bayt, they say, you know, when it comes to the new occurrences, you know, refer to the narrators of our hadith. So this is why throughout history you find that the enemies of Islam have always tried to put a wedge between the people and the ulama because they know that there are three things that are the source for strength among the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Number one, Imam al-Hussein that the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they always have the spirit of revolution. They don't they're not silent in the face of zulm. Number two, the followers of Ahlul Bayt are always optimistic. So we have the spirit of sacrifice, that we oppose tyranny, no matter what it is, even if it's within the ummah. Number two, we have the spirit of hope, which is represented in the 12th Imam. We know that tomorrow is going to be better because of this belief in Mahdawiyyah. And number three, we have Marja'iyyah. You know, the, one of the biggest problems in the Sunni world is power is decentralized. Do you think the Sunni world would be able to mobilize an army like Sayyid Sistani to fight Daesh? You have one individual within, among the ulama, who gives a fatwa and he's able to mobilize millions. He's able to assemble an... Say the Sistani is not a government, but he's able to assemble an army, something that governments can't do with one fatwa. This is power. And this is why you always see that people, the, the enemies of Islam, they don't want the average Shi'i to respect the marja'i. They want to sever this connection because they recognize that there's a lot of power in this institution. So anyone who attacks the institution of Marja'iyya know that they are either knowingly or unknowingly weakening Tashayya. So our responsibility in this time is to look to our ulama for guidance, to not think that, oh, we don't need them. You know, we're intellectuals. We can figure it out on our own. We have to refer we have to respect this chain of command that was placed there by the Imams. The Imams never said that, you know, go read for yourselves and you guys are smart enough to figure out. The Imams say, you know, refer to Ruwat Hadithina. 
فارجعوا فيها إلى رواة حديثنا فإنهم حجتي عليكم وأنا حجة الله they are a حجه upon you the imam says they have authority over you the twelfth imam gave them authority over us so we have to refer to them and we have to respect them and we have to ask them for guidance and inshallah we will be successful um sheikh in a uh, verse 15 it says allah will remove rage from the hearts of the moment uh what rage is it talking about like what was the cause of the rage i mean rage is it's very natural to have extreme anger if you know that these individuals they killed members of your family or they usurped your home and your wealth so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed the system where he said i will remove this rage from your heart by compensating you in such a way that you know through through this war you might be able to collect spoils of war or you might be able to 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 you know to kill those individuals who who killed members of your family your loved ones so he will remove that that rage that you have that you will finally taste that uh you'll be able to avenge the death of loved ones for example because that rage just eats oh, away at them but because permission has not been granted to them to fight so they have all of this anger and you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed them to channel it against these individuals it sounds like earlier the verses were talking specifically to the people who did not want to fight and now in these effects it's kind of expanded that to both people who were didn't were averse to fighting and people who also were more willing to fight to begin with it seems it seems that you know among the muslims you have people who are anxious who are itching to fight and then you have people who are reluctant I mean, even if you look at the early history of islam if you look at the battle of badr and uhud for example you have people like Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet, who is just itching to, to be in the battlefield. And then you have others who shall remain nameless, who when the, the swords are drawn, they run. So you have different categories of Muslims. You have those who are highly motivated, highly motivated to go and protect their honor and to defend and to you know recover the things that they've lost. And then you have those who are hesitant who are who are attached to dunya who are afraid so yeah this this definitely could be a reference to uh to you to a different uh group within the muslims